Well, again, uh, we're looking at the Great Awakening, the revival that took place in America during the 18th century. Actually, we've seen more than one revival. And what we're looking at in this last lecture is how to promote revival and really what they did in those days to continue the work that the Lord was doing, at least to seek Him to grant what was necessary. And what we have in this picture right here is what is necessary, and that is prayer. And again, just by way of review, revival is a work of God. It's certainly uh, brought about through the means that God has given to us, and that is primarily prayer and evangelism. But as we saw this morning, without prayer, you might as well forget the evangelism. You really need to seek the Lord for his blessing. Uh, otherwise, when you share the gospel with other people, it's not going to have the effect that it might otherwise have. The Spirit of God needs to bring it home. So we saw how the Lord did pour out of his Holy Spirit in those days. We saw the revival of 1735. We looked at uh, the Great Awakening. Uh, we also la saw last week the, um, well, the, the people who were the critics uh, against the Great Awakening and how, as Edward sought to defend the work of God, uh, the two different works that he produced, the one was called the Distinguishing Marks of the Work of the Spirit of God, which, uh, in which he points out that uh, in the revival, though there were things that certainly were of the flesh, they were sinful, there were things that Satan was doing to try to discredit the, um, the revival, as well as others who were pointing those things out, basically saying because of these things, because of the fanaticism and the enthusiasm, they called it, uh, the whole revival was basically a work of the flesh or a work of Satan. Uh, Edwards pointed out there were things that took place that Satan would not have brought about, such as love for the Lord, the most important thing. So he points out in the distinguishing marks what it is the Spirit of God actually brings, and only the Spirit of God will bring, showing that the revival must be from the Lord. And then I think you'll also recall that um, uh, because there was the, the pendulum, as it were, swung so, so strongly to one side of experientialism that the church overreacted and pushed the pendulum the other way, uh, getting rid of all experiences, at least wanting to, and uh, saying that uh, Christianity was basically a system of right belief. If you have just the right belief, that's all you need. Um, but Edwards pointed out, no, it's more than just a right belief. Re Christianity, true religion, is a matter of the heart. So he wrote the book, The Religious Affections, to point out how a person might know that they are truly a Christian. Not just that they have right belief, they need that, but that they have a heart that truly loves God, as we saw last week, primarily for His holiness and not because of what you think that God gave you. Although we should certainly love him for those things, it has to go beyond the gifts, and it has to go to the giver. And that particular aspect of the giver, which um, Satan would never counterfeit, which is, of course, a love for his holiness. All right, well, tonight we're going to consider um, what those who experienced this revival did further to promote the work of God. So we're going to consider how to promote revival, at least how these men did it, uh, again, these churches, how all the people of God sought the Lord, and what we might be able to do to see the Lord's work in our day. Now, there were certainly uh, difficulties that Edwards had to deal with during the revival, and afterwards, uh, actually, we're not going to get into everything that Edwards had to deal with because it wasn't directly connected to the revival, but there was also the communion controversy that came up because of the halfway covenant and, uh, and Solomon Stoddard's, uh, as it were, uh, giving the other part of the, uh, uh, of the sacraments to, uh, actually I need to explain that. The halfway covenant was, it took place of course in a pedo-baptist um, circumstance where children were baptized and they, they grew up in the church and because the bar of um, what, was, what was required to become a member of the church, a communicant member, was set so high. Uh, very few were actually presenting themselves for communicant membership. So these children grew up. They never left the church. They uh, stayed in the church. They married in the church. And they began having children in the church. But they never made profession of faith because the bar was set so high. 
Well, when they had their children, the question was asked, what do we do with these children? Do we baptize them or not? And they decided to baptize them, believing that they were members of God's covenant community. That was called the halfway covenant. Now, Solomon Stoddard gave, uh, the, decided to give these children who had been baptized and who were not living outwardly ungodly lives the other sacrament as well. Uh, and it was called converting ordinances, the idea that um, if they come to the Lord's table, Perhaps the Lord will give them grace in order to save them. Now, Edwards believed that was wrong. He believed you had to be a, a believer. You had to be a, uh, well, you had to uh, present yourself for examination and be accepted as a communicant member. And that got him into a controversy since Solomon Stoddard's view had, had virtually inundated uh, the whole area. And he was eventually expelled for that. So that was one of the, uh, expelled from his church. That was one of the difficulties he had to face, but what we're going to look at this evening uh, were well, one of the two encouragements that led to a major book on his part that became very influential, not only in his day, but also in the later part of the 18th century and 19th century that helped provoke the great missionary movement it was actually, uh, well, the book we're not going to look at, as a matter of fact, is the book that the Lord used to motivate William Carey to go to India uh, with the gospel. But this other book that we're going to be looking at, which is called An Humble Attempt, is um, the other book that um, the Lord used to promote prayer that eventually brought about the uh, great missionary movement. So one of the encouragements that Edwards received uh, during this time was from the correspondence that he had to those in Scotland. Uh, his faithful narrative, which was the account of the revival of 1735, was reprinted in Scotland in 1737, but it wasn't until 1742 that he had gained a reputation as a theologian. In that year, John McLaren of Glasgow and James Robe of Kils Kilsyth, two of the leading evangelical preachers of the Church of Scotland, began to correspond with him. In 1743, Edwards also began to correspond with William McCulloch of Cambuslang. Sorry, we don't have pictures of these gentlemen. And Thomas Gillespie of, of Carnac soon joined the correspondence in 1746. Most importantly, John Erskine in 1747. The reason why these names are important was because these particular leaders of uh, the evangelical church in Scotland uh, were the ones who, um, well, were the important leaders, the ones that, that um, uh, brought about, I, I believe, reform even in the Scottish church. Now, Erskine himself was a part of Scottish nobility. Like Calvin, he was heading for the legal profession when the Lord converted him in his student days in Edinburgh. Uh, though his family was opposed to it, I believe it was the case of Calvin as well, he entered into the ministry at Kirk and Tillich in 1744, and he went to Clarosse in 1753, and finally to Edinburgh in 1758, where he would exercise tremendous influence until his death in 1803. He was only 26 years old when he first wrote to Edwards, and his correspondence with Edwards lasted throughout Edwards' life. He corresponded with, I, I believe, at least two of Edwards' sons, and one of Edward's grandsons for a total of 56 years. John Erskine became the first editor of Edward's books and his most dedicated overseas promoter in Britain. And again, I mentioned to you already, it was through his influence that William Carey brought one of Edward's books, The Life and Diary of David Brainerd, with him to India in 1792 becoming basically a link between Edwards and the missionary movement that began in Britain uh, before the end of the 18th century, but after Edwards and perhaps some of his other correspondents had gone to be with the Lord. Uh, that his communications with these Scottish evangelicals meant a great deal to him can be seen by the number and length of his letters, as also his determination to write to them despite the difficulties that they had to face. You know, in those days, you couldn't just pick up a telephone and call. Uh, there were no texts, you know, on your cell phones, no emails. And the postal service was extremely primitive. As much as a year could pass between the writing of a letter and gaining uh, the reply to that letter. 
To make matters worse for Edwards, uh, Thomas Prince, a gentleman we had uh, seen in previous lectures, who lived in Boston and received his return mail, often forgot that he had the mail in his house. One time, Edwards had to explain to McCulloch that his last letter, quote, lay, along, uh, lay a long while at Mr. Prince's in Boston before I received it. It seemed he had forgotten that he had any such letter. And when I sent a messenger to his house on purpose to inquire whether I had any letter lodged there for me from Scotland, he told him, no, when I supposed this letter had been long in his house. And I should probably never have had it at last had not one of my daughters had occasion to go to Boston who made a visit at the house and made a more full inquiry. Actually, I don't think there was a postal service in those days. You basically found somebody who was willing to, you know, a friend who was willing to pass it to somebody who worked in the shipping industry who would pass it off to somebody else on the other side and eventually would get to the person uh, that you wanted. So Prince apparently complicated matters a bit more. Although there were several obstacles, they didn't dissuade him from keeping up the communication. It was not only encouraging to Edwards personally, but it yielded an important result, establishing an international bond of prayer. The letters often ended with such things as, quote, desiring that we may meet often at the throne of grace, close quote. Well, this correspondence eventually brought about what was called a concert for united prayer. In October of 1744, a group of evangelical ministers in Scotland, uh, the leaders of which were Edward's correspondents, formed a union for the purpose of praying for the worldwide extension and prosperity of Christ's kingdom. This is key. They decided that some part of every Saturday evening and Sabbath morning and the whole are, poor, are part of the first Tuesday of every quarter, beginning the first Tuesday of November and at three months' intervals thereafter, should be given to united extraordinary supplications to the God of all grace, earnestly praying to Him that He would appear in His glory and favor Zion and manifest His compassion to the world of mankind by an abundant effusion or outpouring of His Holy Spirit on all the churches and the whole habitable earth to revive true religion in all parts of Christendom and to deliver all nations from their great and manifold spiritual calamities and miseries and bless them with the unspeakable benefits of the kingdom of our glorious Redeemer. Now the news of this union reached John Wesley in England who then suggested that the ministers of North America might also be invited to participate. Writing to his Scottish correspondent, Lord Grange, and, and this, I'm not, I haven't been able to clear this up, but I believe uh, he was also an Erskine. This is Wesley, this is the Lord Grange in question, Gilbert Tennant and Jonathan Edwards. But writing to his Scottish correspondent, Lord Grange, on March the 16th, 1745, he asks, might it not be practicable to have the concurrence of Mr. Edwards in New England, if not of Mr. Tennant also herein? It is evidently one work with what we have seen here. Why should we not all praise God with one heart? Actually, I don't know what you think of that quote. It does, does me good to read that. Sometimes you wonder if these guys weren't all just enemies uh, because they didn't agree you know, on certain things. Uh, you probably remember that John Wesley uh, took several of Edwards' works and uh, went through and edited everything he didn't agree with and then published his own version of it. Um, and then you know that Top Lady and Wesley got into some squabble over, um, well, over predestination. Um, and again, the motive for Top Lady was God should receive all the glory for all these things. But anyway, it's good to see that Wesley was interested in including these others, these Calvinistic ministers, to participate in this prayer. Now, by the time he had written his letter, either Robe or McCulloch had already sent word of this union for prayer to Northampton. When Edward's reply was received in Scotland, it was immediately published in the Christian Monthly History, November of 1745. In it, Edwards wrote, one thing that has been very joyful to me 
that I have been informed of in the letters I have received from you and my other correspondents, your dear neighbors and brethren, is that concert that has come into by many of God's people in Scotland and England for united prayer to God for the pouring out of his Holy Spirit on his church and the world of mankind. Such an agreement and practice appears to me exceeding beautiful and becoming Christians. And I doubt not, but it is so in Christ's eyes. It seems to be a thing peculiarly becoming us in the state the things are in at the present day. God has lately done great things before our eyes, whereby he has shown us something of his wonderful power and mercy. But has withal so disposed things that events have tended remarkably to show us our weakness, infirmity, insufficiency, and great and universal need of God's help. We have been many ways rebuked for our self-confidence and looking to instruments and trusting in an arm of flesh. And God is now showing us that we are nothing and letting us see that we can do nothing. It is apparent that we can't help ourselves and have nowhere else to go but to God. Second Chronicles 20, verse 12, we know not what to do. Our eyes are upon thee. Edwards goes on to say that he had taken many of the letters that he had received from Scotland into his pulpit to read to his people using many arguments with them to comply with the thing proposed, trying to get them to be engaged in prayer. Initially, the response was poor in Northampton and the neighboring communities. Edwards, however, convinced of its importance, continued to hold the proposal before his congregation. He wrote to John McLaren on May the 12th, 1746, who was the primary promoter of this union in Scotland. With respect to the concert for prayer, for the pouring out of the Spirit of God, the people of this town have of late more generally fallen in with it. Before the last quarterly season, I preached on a subject tending to excite to the duty of united prayer for a general outpouring of the Spirit. What was delivered seemed to have a great influence on the congregation. And the first Tuesday of February last was pretty generally observed in whole or part as a day of prayer in private societies for the forementioned blessing. Again, this wasn't just a church gathering, but people got together in, in their homes, opening their homes for others to come, what he called private societies, to pray. The next year on February the 3rd, 1747, during a Tuesday lecture, he dealt again with this theme from Zechariah 8, verses 20 through 22. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. By the way, this is the text that Edward's book, A Humble Attempt, uh, was based on. In Scotland, the concert for United Prayer was originally set for two years, but it was renewed for another seven in 1746. A short memorial to explain its purpose was drawn up by the Scottish ministers, and about 500 copies were sent to New England. In February of 1747, Edwards determined to explore the theme of his Zachariah sermon more fully. <coughs> By the time he wrote to William McCulloch on September of 1747, his work was completed. He wrote, the propagation of it, of it is but slow, but yet so many do fall in with it, and there is that prospect of its being further spread, that it is a great encouragement to me. I earnestly hope that they that have begun extraordinary prayer for the outpouring of the Spirit of God and the coming of Christ's kingdom will not fail or grow dull and lifeless in such an affair, but rather that they will increase more and more in their fervency. I have taken a great deal of pains to promote this concert here in America and shall not cease to do so if God spares my life as I have opportunity in all ways that I can devise. 
I have written largely on the subject, insisting on persuasions and answering objections, and what I have written is gone to the press. Well, it was slow at the printers, as is probably typically the case in those days, but it finally appeared in January of 1748 with the title, An Humble Attempt to Promote Explicit Agreement and Visible Union of God's People in Extraordinary Prayer for the Revival of Religion and the Advancement of Christ's Kingdom on Earth Pursuant to Scripture. Promises and Prophecies Concerning the Last Time. In its first edition, it was 168 pages long. Samuel Miller writes regarding the book, instead of making his humble attempt a pamphlet of 20 or 30 pages, as most men would have done, he made it a volume rich, instructive, carefully reasoned, and of permanent value. On all subjects he wrote, not for his contemporaries alone, but for posterity. Edwards intended to promote earnest prayer, but he did so in a biblical framework. He saw in scripture basically these things. First of all, the kingdom advances when the power of the Holy Spirit accompanies the gospel. That's something we've been seeing over and over again. But it has by no means reached its full scope. For a very great part of the world is but lately discovered and much remains undiscovered to this day. Scripture indicates that there is a far greater day coming. Edwards first reviews the biblical passages dealing with the subject, then concludes the apostle in the 11th of Romans, 11th chapter, teaches us to look on that great outpouring of the Spirit and ingathering of souls into Christ's kingdom in those days first of the Jews and then of the Gentiles, to be but as the first fruits of the intended harvest, both with regard to Jews and Gentiles, as a sign that all should in due time be gathered in. The apostle speaks of the fullness of both Jews and Gentiles as what shall hereafter be brought in, distinctly from the ingathering from among both in those primitive ages of Christianity. These things plainly show us or show that the time is coming when the whole world of mankind shall be brought into the church of Christ, the fullness of both, the whole lump. Now, I should pause there just for a moment and point out that Edwards didn't believe that just because they were brought into the church that they were converted. But again, the idea of all nations serving the Lord, every knee bowing before him would indicate that they would be connected to the church in some way. Now, Edwards believed that this final period, which would be one of worldwide blessing, would come after the conversion of Israel. And this, for Edwards, is the latter-day glory or the millennium of Revelation 20. I'm going to mention that not, not everyone who would hold to Edwards' view of end times would necessarily agree with that point regarding uh, Israel. Certainly, all of the... Of, of those whom the Lord has chosen out of both Jews and Gentiles will be converted, but uh, there are many who don't believe that God has a, a, an intention separately to turn to ethnic Israel and to deal with them, but rather that when it is said in the scriptures, not in Romans 11, or be, well, yeah, Romans 11, because uh, that's the one he's referring to, I don't think that that's really what that's teaching, but looking at the Old Testament prophecies, that they're likely going to be fulfilled in the true Israel of God, which is the church, those who believe in Christ from both the Jews and the Gentiles, the true children of promise who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the true seed of Abraham who have faith like Abraham. Now, Edwards had expressed some hope earlier in a work published in 1743 that the revival, the great awakening, might be leading up to this glorious age. He says, it is not unlikely that this work of God's spirit, so extraordinary and wonderful, is the dawning, or at least a prelude, of that glorious work of God, so often foretold in Scripture, what is now seen in America, especially in New England, may prove the dawn of that glorious day. Now, Chauncey, as you know, who was uh, one of Edwards' leading critics, accused Edwards of teaching that the millennium had begun 
But that's not what he said. And by the way, millennium, in, in his view, the post-millennial view, would be that golden age, um, that, that this great awakening was dawning of that uh, particular blessing that he was looking forward to. But Edwards did not say that, only that the revival could be the forerunner of that great time. In his humble attempt, he expresses the same conviction that the Spirit of God has been of late so wonderfully striving with such multitudes in so many different parts of the world and even to this day in one place or other continues to awaken men is what I should take encouragement from that God was about to do something more glorious and would before he finishes bring things to a greater ripeness and not finally suffer this work of his to be frustrated and rendered abortive by Satan's crafty management. By the way, that last statement about frustrated and rendered abortive and so forth by Satan, that's what he saw the enthusiasm as that we looked at uh, last Lord's Day evening. And I, I don't know if I mentioned it in the lectures, I may have in some of the conversations that I had, but. The revival of 1735 ended in Edward's, um, in, in Edward's belief uh, when his uncle thought he heard the Lord telling him to commit suicide, and he did, and when he did, the revival ended. So that would be one of Satan's um, attempts to frustrate or to abort God's revival. The other attempt would be uh, the fanaticism, the enthusiasm that we saw uh, last week. So what he was saying is that um, the Lord was going to bring something greater and he wasn't going to allow these things to happen. He goes on to say, and may we not hope that these unusual commotions are the forerunners of something exceeding glorious approaching as the wind, earthquake, and fire at Mount Sinai were forerunners of that voice wherein God was in a more eminent manner. Now, Edwards didn't believe that one had to calculate the date when these future blessings were going to begin in order to pray for them. The fact that in Scripture there was a great deal of unfulfilled prophecy that was indicating that this time was coming was enough. Now, there was at least one other reason why he took up this subject and why he wrote this book, An Humble Attempt, because he knew that there were certain views that some entertained that actually discouraged prayer. There were people who believed the scriptures were saying that dark times were ahead, so we might as well not bother uh, to pray. There are a number who believed the darkest hour of the church uh, was coming. And by the way, I should mention that the reason why they believed that was because of their view of the book of Revelation. As you know, there's a lot of different interpretations of that book. It's a very difficult book to understand. And in their view, they believe the book was basically laying out church history from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. And every one of the symbols, the bulls, vials, and judgments, and so forth, all had to do with different events in church history. Now, in the view that he was dealing with here, there were those who believed that the darkest hour of the church was symbolized by the slaying of the two witnesses in Revelation 11, and that that was still to come. And because it was that uh, golden age, the millennium, which was in Revelation 20, was still a long ways away. Edwards argued that the two witnesses were already fulfilled in the desolation of the pre-Reformation church. He held to the view that was expounded by Moses Lohman, that they were currently at the pouring out of the sixth vial Revelation 16, 12. He was, though, critical of Loman's date setting, particularly his um, argument that the end of Antichrist's reign would not be until the year 2000. <laughs> Interesting, again, date setters all throughout the history of the church. Now, he urges that instead of expecting these things to happen at one stroke, this is interesting because we were just talking about this the other day, that we should expect these things to happen more gradually. What things? Well, Murray writes, the overthrow of unbelief in Christendom, the conversion of the Jews, and the full enlightenment of all Mohammedan and heathen nations will not, he asserts, be accomplished in one great conflict. Rather, such things will come to pass in answer to prayer through successive revivals. 
a succession in which the awakening of 1740 played its own notable part. Thus he argues, if God does not grant that greatest of all effusions of his spirit so soon as we desire, there will be all reason to hope that we shall receive some blessed token of his acceptance. If the fall of mystical Babylon and the work of God's spirit that shall bring it to pass be at several hundred years distance, yet it follows not that there will be no happy revivals of religion before that time, which shall be richly worth the most diligent, earnest, and constant prayer. By the way, this fall of mystical Babylon, uh, their view of, of Babylon was that it was the Roman church, uh, starting off with Rome itself, but then seeing a continuation of it within the Roman church and seeing that as something that the Lord needed to overthrow. I believe in their view, too, the Pope was the Antichrist. So anyway, that's what he has in view here. From this, it's clear that Edwards, of course, held to the, what's called the historicist interpretation of Revelation, which has largely been rejected today. But even so, the humble attempt is still an important work. Things that Edwards saw from Scripture actually came to pass. Um, the Lord has accomplished it mainly through the great missionary movement, such as the gospel would advance, throughout all parts of Africa, Asia, America, and Australia, and that's what happened. Murray writes, it is arguable that no such tract on the hidden source of all true evangelistic success, namely prayer for the Spirit of God, has ever been so widely used as this one. In the 1820s, over 70 years later, when for the first time worldwide missionary endeavor was becoming a reality, S. E. Dwight could speak of his grandfather's book, his grandfather being Edwards, as having, through the divine blessing, exerted an influence singularly powerful in rousing the church of Christ. Unquestionably, Edwards' words were used to implant his own faith in the worldwide success of the gospel and others. And this conviction, Dwight could say, has been a primary cause of the present concentrated movement of the whole church of God to hasten forward the reign of the Messiah. What you believe has a great bearing on what you're actually going to seek God for, and that's, that's a very important point that we want to see. Edwards believed greater things were on the horizon. God had made those promises. Therefore, we should seek the Lord for his blessing and the outpouring of spirit. They sought it. God granted it. And again, that's what we ought to be doing. Now, Edwards saw the unity in prayer that was experienced by both sides of the Atlantic as a gracious act of God. The problems that were present in the Great Awakening and that followed were all, all a part of God's plan so that the church might learn to wait on God alone in prayer. Now, these difficulties didn't weaken Edwards' faith, but rather strengthened his faith he knew that even though he didn't see any present success that is following the Great Awakening, that that was no indication of what God ultimately intended to do. This is another very important point because the reason why the church, um, at least the, um, well, I think the church in general, shifted from a post-millennial view, which was very optimistic, to an amillennial view, which is, I wouldn't say pessimistic, but it would be compared to um, uh, the post-mill view, was because of World War I and World War II. But Edwards, looking at the present circumstances, didn't let that dictate to him what God was intending to do. Rather, he looked at the scriptures. So he wrote, in the second quote here, to one of his Scottish correspondents, Jacob and the woman of Canaan met with great discouragements while they were wrestling for a blessing, but they persevered and obtained their request. So again, it's not what you see, that's not what faith does. It doesn't act on what you see, but on what you don't see. It acts on what God says, rather than on sight of what is going on in the world. And that really brings us to what we can do today to promote revival. I mean, currently we don't see a great deal of success of the gospel, but that is no indication of what the Lord ultimately intends to do. 
Perhaps we can find some encouragement in Edward's book, A Humble Attempt, uh, to get us moving in the right direction. Here are some points we want to look at. I think it's clear from what we've seen throughout the series that the key to the advancement of God's kingdom is the Holy Spirit. If he isn't poured out, if he doesn't work, then the kingdom's not going to advance. But it's also clear that the way to get the Spirit's help is through prayer. But you need to realize that, as you know from our own Lord's prayer in the garden, when he was praying, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In order to pray a prayer in faith, that prayer has to be attached to a promise. God has to say, this is what he is going to do before you can pray and ask him to do that thing. Otherwise, you have to say something to the effect, if it is your will. In which case, you really don't know what the Lord is intending on doing. You just know that God is going to do what is best in that circumstance. Well, if we are to pray in faith, we have to have scripture promises to plead. And Edwards believed that there were many in scripture. Now let's just consider the opening statements of his book. And again, the book is based upon this, this text in the book of Zechariah, chapter eight, verses 20 through 23. And here we have it in a slightly more modern version. Thus says the Lord of hosts, it will yet be that peoples will come, even the inhabitants of many cities, the inhabitants of one will go to another saying, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will also go. So many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. Now, what does Edwards have to say about this? Well, he says in this chapter, we have a prophecy of a future glorious advancement of the church of God, wherein it is evident that something further is intended than ever was fulfilled to the Jewish nation under the Old Testament. For here are plain prophecies of such things as never were fulfilled before the coming of the Messiah and particularly what is said in the last two verses of the chapter, of many people and strong nations worshiping and seeking the true God. And of so great an accession of Gentile nations to the church of God, that by far the greater part of the visible worshipers should consist of this new accession, so that they um, should be to the other as 10 to one, a certain number for an uncertain. There has never happened anything from the time of the prophet Zechariah to the coming of Christ to answer this prophecy. It can have no fulfillment, but either in the calling of the Gentiles in and after the days of the, of the apostles or in the future glorious enlargement of the church of God in the latter ages of the world, so often foretold by the prophets of the Old Testament and by the prophet Zechariah in particular, in the latter part of his prophecy, it is most probable that what the Spirit of God has chiefly respect to is that last and greatest enlargement and most glorious advancement of the church of God on earth and in the benefits of which especially the Jewish nation were to have a share, a very eminent and distinguished share. Again, this is perhaps one area where I might disagree with Edwards. I don't think the Lord is going to be dealing as many, again, dispensationalists also believe, turning to the Jews since God's judgment basically fell on them for their crucifying of his son. And the Lord has set the nation aside, taking the kingdom of heaven away from them and giving it to a nation that would produce its fruits, that being the church, the true Israel of God. So if you understand these prophecies is referring to that, basically the Gentiles will be coming to the church in order to uh, receive, as it were, this, this blessing. We know that God is with you, so let us go up with you. Let's see. Um, now I forgot where we are. Mm, did, did I read this already? Okay, let's move on to the next. There is a great agreement between what is here said and other prophecies that must manifestly have respect to the church's latter-day glory. 
as Isaiah 60, verses 2 through 4. The Lord shall arise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to you. That whole chapter beyond all dispute has respect to the most glorious state of the church of God on earth. So Isaiah 66, 8, shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Shall a nation be born at once? Verse 10, rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you that love her. Verse 12, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Micah 4, 1, etc. But in the last day it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it and many nations shall come and, and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. See also Isaiah 2 at the beginning. There has not been nothing yet brought to pass in any measure to answer these prophecies. And as the prophecy in my text in the following verse agrees with them, so there is reason to think it has a respect to the same times. And indeed, there is a remarkable agreement in the description given throughout the chapter with the representations made of those times elsewhere in the prophets. So that however the prophet in some parts of this chapter may have respect to future smiles of heaven on the Jewish nation lately returned from the Babylonish captivity and resettled in the land of Canaan, a great increase of their numbers and wealth, and the return of more captives from Chaldea and other countries, etc. Yet the Spirit of God has doubtless respect to things far greater than these, and of which these were but faint resemblances. We find it common in the prophecies of the Old Testament that when the prophets are speaking of divine favors and blessings on the Jews attending or following their return from the Babylonish captivity or the Babylonian captivity, the Spirit of God takes occasion from thence to speak of the incomparably greater blessings on the church that shall attend and follow her deliverance from the spiritual or mystical Babylon of which those were a type. And then speaks almost wholly of these latter and vastly greater things so as to seem to forget the former. And whereas the prophet in this chapter speaks of God bringing his people again from the east and west to Jerusalem and multitudes of all nations taking hold of the skirts of the Jews, so far as this means literally the nation of the posterity of Jacob, it cannot chiefly respect any return of the Jews from Babylon and other countries in those ancient times before Christ, for no such things attended any such return must therefore have respect to the great calling and gathering of the Jews into the fold of Christ and their being received the blessing of his kingdom after the fall of Antichrist or the destruction of mystical Babylon. Now, as I mentioned before, since it really is impossible to pray in faith without a particular blessing or actually a particular blessing promised from the Lord, it really is important to come to grips with what these passages actually mean and many others like them in Scripture. Does the Lord intend to extend his kingdom beyond what we now see? Does he intend to fill the earth with his glory and move all the nations to seek the earth? Again, we've been looking at this over, you know, throughout this month, so many of you are familiar with those passages that are often referred to. We do have that, well, what we just sang in, in, in our hymn when we opened up this topic, that in Psalm 2, the Lord has enthroned his son and he calls upon the nations to worship him. Uh, we see that a promise is given to the son in Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
which is repeated in 1 Corinthians 15, and that he must reign until all of his enemies are subdued under his feet. The last enemy is death, which he will subdue at his second coming. Uh, Christ tells us in the Lord's Prayer that we are to pray that, that God's name would be reverenced, um, uh, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's the promise that every knee one day shall bow to him. And um, let's see, there was one other item. Oh, yes, it was the Great Commission where the Lord sends his disciples out and really giving a charge to the church of all ages through that. Make disciples of all the nations. Well, the reason why they are to do that is because Christ has been enthroned with the promise that all of his enemies will submit to him. And, of course, that he will gain all of his sheep, all of those whom the Father has promised to give him as a reward for his work. We have that promise again in, in Daniel chapter 2, the statue that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had in his dream, and, of course, the stone that was cut without hands that shattered the feet of the statue. And then after the statue toppled and was destroyed and the wind blew it all away, all that remains is the stone which grows into a great mountain that fills the whole earth, a kingdom that is set up in the days of those kings that will never be destroyed and never given to another people. That is the kingdom of the Messiah, which one day is going to fill the whole earth. And again, the kingdom parables, we have several different indications of that. We really need to come to grips with what those passages are actually teaching, because if we, if we don't believe that that is teaching an extension of the kingdom of God on earth, then we really don't have a promise to plead in our prayers so that we can pray with the kind of faith necessary, as it were, to move God, humanly speaking, to do what he has promised to do in Scripture. If God hasn't given a promise, you really don't know it's his will, then you really can't pray in faith. But if those promises are there and that is what they mean, then you can pray knowing that God will hear and answer those prayers because that is his will. Whenever we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, of course, in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, because Jesus alone deserves to be heard by the Father. I'm sorry? Okay. And we don't pressure people to make a commitment before they understand Christ. Right, well, I, what, I, what he's done for us. I think I would certainly agree with you on that. Well, I'll tell you, we'll talk about that after the, after the lecture during the times of questions and answers, okay? All right, but anyway, we do still need to come to grips with what God has promised in order to be able to pray for this. And this is really what's behind what's going on here. Now, as I mentioned before, the church in Edward's day believed quite strongly that these prophecies looked forward to a greater day for the church. Now, let me read for you some quotes from the American editor of this particular work, and it will, I think, reflect for you uh, what they believed, and I think you'll find it be quite consistent, of course, with what we've seen. The ruin of Satan's miserable kingdom and the advancement of the universal and happy reign of Christ on the earth were included and hinted at in the sentence denounced on the serpent, that the seed of the woman should bruise his head. What was a terrible threatening to Satan in the surprised ears of our first guilty parents implied a joyful prophecy to keep them from despair and enliven their hopes for themselves and their descendants of obtaining by this seed of hers an eternal triumph over him who had so sadly foiled them. 
And it is likely that their hope and faith immediately arose, laid hold on that reviving prophecy, earnestly desired its happy accomplishment, and transmitted it to their posterity. But through this prophecy, oh, excuse me, but though this prophecy was at first only delivered in the form of a threatening to Satan, it was afterwards directly given in the form of a promise to Abraham, though still in general terms that in his seed should all the nations of the earth be blessed. Yet this general promise was more clearly by degrees explained in the following ages to mean a divine king, no other than the Son of God, assuming human nature of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David, that should be born of a virgin in Bethlehem of Judah, and at first despised, abused, rejected, and put to death, but should rise to immortal life, ascend to heaven, and thence extend his blessed kingdom over all nations, not by outward force, but inward overcoming influence by his word and spirit, making them his willing people in the day of his power, and reigning in glorious light and holiness, love and peace forever. And the advancement of this universal and happy reign has been the earnest desire and prayer of the saints in all ages to the present day. But how great the honor and how lively the encouragement given in Scripture to those, their prayers, by representing them as offered by Christ himself with the fragrant incense of his own merits and intercession on the golden altar before the throne and ascending together in one grateful perfume to God. And how cheering to every saint is that promise, from the rising of the sun even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure offering. How pleasing to God and all the heavenly hosts to see as the sun goes round the globe this grateful incense rising from every part on high. The more extensive and incessant are these prayers ascending from the circle of the earth, the more does this blessed promise go into its desired fulfillment. And the holy God is more pleased and glorified. To promote the increase and constancy of these acceptable prayers is the great intention both of the pious memorial of our reverend and dear brethren in Scotland and of the worthy author of this exciting essay. And this design we cannot but recommend to all who desire the coming of the blissful kingdom in its promised extent and glory in this wretched world. Now again, I think you got an idea of what it is that the saints believed in those days. Certainly the author of this uh, preface believed what Edwards wrote in his book, looked to those prophecies, had the expectancy that one day throughout the entire earth there would be prayers lifted up to the Lord. Now, the, because they believed these things, that's the reason why they sought the Lord in prayer. Here's the preface of that memorial written in Scotland. I believe that's um, what we have here, or either that or it's Edward's explanation of it. It says, in, in October of 1744, a number of ministers in Scotland, taking into consideration the state of God's church and of the world of mankind, judged that the providence of God at such a day did loudly call upon such as were concerned for the welfare of Zion to united extraordinary applications to the God of all grace, suitably acknowledging him as the fountain of all the spiritual benefits and blessings of his church and earnestly praying to him that he would appear in his glory and favor Zion and manifest his compassion to the world of mankind by an abundant effusion of his Holy Spirit on all the churches and the whole habitable earth to revive true religion in all parts of Christendom and to deliver all nations from their great and manifold spiritual calamities and miseries and bless them with the unspeakable benefits of the kingdom of our glorious Redeemer and fill the whole earth with his glory. Consulting one another on the subject, they looked upon themselves for their own part, obliged to engage in this duty, and as far as, uh, as in them lay, to persuade others to the same, and to endeavor to find out and fix on some method 
that should most effectively tend to promote and uphold such extraordinary application to heaven among God's people. So again, the response for the, to the promises. I mean, not only do you need the promises to be able to pray in faith, but the response to such promises, if this is what God has actually promised to do, then this is what we need to do as a church. We need to seek God that he would bring this about. And so they came into this concert of prayer. They sought the Lord, and the Lord answered them. But again, the Lord does it in his time. Those who prayed after the Great Awakening did not necessarily see another revival between then and the end of their days, but the Lord still answered their prayer because, as we saw this morning, God will do these things within his time. Before the end of that century, the Lord began the great missionary movement in England, of which William Carey was part. So I hope you can see what it is that we can do in order to promote revival. Basically, we need to seek the Lord. We need to pray. We need to pray diligently. I mean, we, we can't just... The kind of prayer that they, they engaged in, of course, was, was different than perhaps what we're used to. Um, it wasn't just saying, you know, perhaps a phrase or two before you eat or something like that, but they really sought the Lord earnestly. Worshiping the Lord, praising Him, adoring Him, giving Him glory, but then seeking Him earnestly over a period of time, not just days, but while they were engaged in it. Uh, I don't know. I, I didn't actually see how many hours they might have given to this, but certainly one, would, I would imagine, be a minimum. But they sought the Lord, they prayed diligently, and they also prayed in faith. They prayed in faith that God would grant His Spirit to accomplish what he had promised in his word. They looked to those promises and they pled with the Lord to fulfill them. Again, remembering the encouragement of Edwards, Jacob and the woman of Canaan met with great discouragements while they were wrestling for a blessing. And you know, we can pray for quite some time. And because we don't see the results of our prayers, just simply drop off and give up. But we need not to give up. We need not to become discouraged they persevered and obtained their request. And again, it's not that God isn't going to answer our prayers. If we pray for something that He has actually promised to give us, we know that He's heard us, and we know that He's going to give us the things that we have asked for. It just may not be in our time. It may be in the future. It doesn't really matter as long as it's what God wants to take place and as long as we are doing what God wants us to do, which is to seek for those things. But at the same time as that we're praying, we also need to remember that we need to reach out to others, to bring the gospel to them in a way that they can understand, in a way that they can sense that we believe what we're telling them is true, and that we mean them well, and that we desire their conversion because if they don't turn to the Lord, they are going to perish. At the same time, relying on the work of the Holy Spirit to bring that message home to their heart, even though we may pray and seek the Lord to advance His kingdom in revival, doesn't mean, if, even if He doesn't answer that prayer right away, it doesn't mean that He's not going to hear anything you say or do anything to help you. Uh, he's still going to be working in those interactions you have with other people. Just need to pray that God would work by His Holy Spirit to bring those things home to them that they might be saved. So we pray that God would pour out His Spirit in a great measure as they did, but we also at the same time pray that God would keep our hearts warm, that He would warm the hearts of His people within the fellowships who are a part of and His church as a whole, that He would work in the hearts of those that we go to minister to and those we have opportunity to speak with, that God would convert them. And because God still converts even during times of non-revival, it just isn't in such mass. Uh, remember we saw during the Great Awakening people who maybe saw a conversion or two during the year. We're seeing 30 people show up a month you know, that, that were being converted and being added to the church. More people in, in a matter of a couple months than they've seen in, in the whole decade of their ministry prior to that. And God still works. He just works at a slower pace. So we keep up that work. But at the same time, we pray that God would advance these greater ends that he has and bring these blessings that he has promised in his word. So I'm hoping that 
having seen these things and having been exposed to them for really five weeks now, that we'll at least get that um, as, as the important point. God is a God of great things, and He has planned great things, and He can do it with infinite ease. He can do it anytime He pleases. It's our responsibility to believe that and to pray that He would do that. That's what He wants us to do. Would God bring revival apart from our prayers? He could, but very likely He won't because our prayers are what He has ordained in order to bring these things about. He wants us to pray and to seek Him for these things. And we can, because we have these, again, wonderful promises. So let's pray, pray diligently, pray in faith that God would do these things. And in the meantime, let's keep up the work that He's given us to do, even if it goes at a slower pace. Well, are there any questions? Does somebody grab the lights, please? Yes, I'm sorry. We, we actually covered the, the new lights and yes. so forth. Were you, were you covering people who were not in favor of the revival? Of the revival? Oh, yeah. What was their reason? Well, as I mentioned this evening uh, in the introduction, they, they saw some extremes going on. They saw a lot of experientialism going on. They saw some things that were actually brought about by the Holy Spirit, people being overwhelmed, uh, even passing out by their experiencing just the love of God and His mercy and others shrieking with fear because they weren't converted and they were afraid. But too much, some believed it was just too much experientialism and, and some things that really weren't from the Spirit of God. So some, some things weren't authentic oh, yeah. and scriptural. Yeah. And because they pushed against it so hard, they actually pushed experience all the way out of their Christianity which is why Edwards needed to write the book, The Religious Affections, to point out that Christianity is a matter of the heart, it is a matter of the affections. But this is what the Spirit of God does when He works. It's not all this enthusiasm and fanaticism, but it is genuine love for the Lord. So we actually have that posted online. If you have access to a computer, you can see that. When you, when you say you shouldn't pressure people, it, it's true that there's a bad kind of pressure that you can apply, but a good kind of pressure would be love, of course, and, and concern. Um, certainly, we, we would say that um, our Lord certainly gave incentives and motives. There's somebody that calls me about once every other week with a Bible verse, and I don't know which church it is or anything, trying to minister to you, that's good. One thing that we do have to bear in mind is when Jesus and his apostles went out and evangelized, they did apply a great deal of pressure. It just depends on the, on, on the, um, the circumstances. I mean, one to one, we, we should certainly try to motivate people to, to come to church and to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And, but our motivation should be out of love and concern for them. Well, and Can't force a person to become a Christian. Yeah, that's right. Did anyone have any questions or, or comments regarding the, the lectures? Or any further comments or questions? Well, yeah, I think it was interesting. Um, all this is sort of English and Scottish, but um, I was just wondering, there were people coming to the United States from the continent, and it was called the Calvinist Church was called the Reformed Church. Church in Switzerland. And I just wonder.
Was that a, a question? It's true, the uh, Reformed churches, we've been looking over the several years of, of how the Reformation progressed in the different countries. It, it uh, did start churches in virtually every nation in Europe. So we, we have German Reform, Dutch Reform, and as you mentioned, Swiss Reform. And then we have, uh, of course, in Scotland and in, the, uh, in Great Britain, it was more of the Presbyterian than the nonconformists, uh, the Puritans, and the, um, well, the, the Baptist denominations and so forth. Yeah. Mainly, mainly coming from Ian Murray's work on Edwards and also Edwards' uh, book, A Humble Attempt. Yeah. And th that she, I'll put the references on, on here as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Kathy? The, uh, the evangelical ministers in Scotland. The Scots, Scots. Yeah, the, basically the ones that Edwards was corresponding with. Yeah, that was a list basically of the leaders. They were the ones that promoted this. Yeah. Isn't that out of the uh, Well, that, that of course took place, I think, the century before. Um, but they would be, would they be covenanters, you're asking? Very likely, yeah, I would imagine they were. And I believe that Edwards was aware of that, and I think he agreed with it as well. I, I, was there, were there any other questions or comments? Uh, Brian? I just want to thank you for all your building great experiences. Well, thank you. It's, it's actually, a, it, it is a lot of fun. Um, I, I find it to be very encouraging. Obviously, this is a different world, you know, than the one we live in, as far as our, uh, the way they viewed things and what they did. Um, we live in a world of you know, video games and TV and movies and so forth, and they, were, they had the kingdom of heaven before their eyes all the time. And, and I think we should learn something, obviously, of that from them, because um, if we want our lives to count, we really need to have faith. We need to see these things. We need to know that they're real, and we need to act on them. Are there any other questions or comments, Dick? Well, you know what, as I was looking through there, I, I think that may have been applied to Finney's movement and that, that revival, or so-called revival. I, I think we talked a little bit about that in the first part of the, of the series where uh, Finney had, um, had pretty much sort of excluded anything extraordinary from God with regard to a revival. And he believed that if we just use the means God has given to us, we can produce a revival any time, and so they did. And, uh, they believe they got many converts, but uh, again, we, we saw that, um, well, what Finney accomplished was basically to motivate people to a particular decision, talking about pressure. You know, he was very much into pressure and trying to move them emotionally. But that kind of thing, though maybe some were converted into that ministry, uh, not as many as it may have appeared. Yeah. If, if it was the, 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 the movement with Finney. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's pretty much it, what we just saw, um, to, to pray. I mean, these are the things that I was actually mentioning. These, these are our responsibility. To, uh, to pray, to pray diligently, not just you know, for a few moments before a meal. Although that's better than nothing, we should really earnestly seek the Lord. And we should pray with His promises in view. We need to come to grips with those prophecies and what they mean. If God has, in fact, promised that the world is going to be filled with his glory, we should pray that that come about. That's what these men did. That's what these churches did, and believers in private societies and in churches on both sides of the Atlantic, and sought the Lord diligently, and he heard. Prayer is, 
again, it's far more important than I think we realize. The Lord wants us to, to put that time in earnestly to seek him before he's going to move. He's, he's ordained not only the end, but the means to the end, and that's prayer. But at the same time, we need to continue to evangelize. We need to pray that God would revive our hearts. We should pray for others that their hearts would be revived in the sense of you know, more in love with the Lord. And we should seek to reach out to the lost, praying that God would open their eyes. So doing the usual things we should be doing, but, but earnestly seeking the Lord individually in families and in groups and church, and public prayer and, and prayer meetings, that the Lord would fulfill those prophecies and would pour out of the Spirit. Dick, did you have another point? Right. Uh, we, we may disagree with, with Finney, for instance, in the fact that he thought it was all persuasion. But we're not saying that we shouldn't try to be persuasive. You know, we certainly should try to persuade people. But realize that we need the Spirit of God to work in their hearts to, to bring that message home and make it real. It is real, but to help them see it as real before they're actually going to act on it the way they should. Trust Jesus Christ. Any other Comments or questions? John? Uh oh. Oh, yeah. What's the name of the hurricane? Sandy. Sandy, yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else?